The crypto space has become notorious for major hacks. In 2022 alone, we've had over $3 billion stolen from crypto protocols alone. And I've profiled pretty much every single major hack on this channel in the past two years. And to be quite honest, a lot of times things really just don't add up based upon the surface level media coverage of these exploits. Like the latest Temple Dow attack where the developer stole over $2.3 million in a laughably simple exploit that pretty much anybody watching this channel could have performed, which begs the question, you know, was this attack an inside job? What about others just like this? Were they performed by people who actually wrote the code or were familiar with the code base, maybe through auditing the projects? Well, that's exactly what I'm gonna talk about today in this video as a blockchain developer myself. I'm going to tell you the truth about all this. So if you're around here, hey, I'm Gregory, and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to become a blockchain master step-by-step from start to finish, then head on over to adaptuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right, so let's dig into this. Let's talk about the truth behind the $2.3 million Temple DAO exploit. So I talked about this in one of my live streams that I do weekly on this channel. Just subscribe, turn on notifications. I do those on Mondays. You're going to find out about those whenever we go live. Uh, but I want to make this dedicated video, okay, because I want to break this down even further for two main reasons. You know, number one, you know, anybody who, who watches this channel, generally speaking, could have probably found this and taken advantage of this opportunity, not so you can steal money yourself, but so you can ethically disclose it. I'll talk about that towards the end of the video. Uh, but also peel back the truth behind this, because if that's the case, then how could this have been so obvious just sitting there for a really long time without anybody taking advantage of it? Could it actually have been uh, something that was an inside job? So I'll give you my take on that as well. So let's start off like with what this attack is in the first place. So, you know, Temple Dow is a DeFi project that offers yields on deposits. Okay, and so basically people can add money to this project and stake it and, you know, do yield farming that way. So this protocol is undergoing an upgrade, okay, and basically they had to move funds from one smart contract to another, okay. And so there was a, a smart contract that's responsible for doing this. We can actually see this profile by BlockSec here. Uh, they actually migrated the funds from one contract to the new contract. And so there's a special function inside of here called migrate stake. Okay, you can see it takes the old staking address and the amount, and basically it, it migrates the withdrawal from message sender and the amount, okay? And the problem is that this function didn't have proper access control on it. And anybody who has a MetaMask wallet could have gotten on Etherscan and, you know, called this function that was supposed to be protected by a very specific contract and, you know, taken these funds. So essentially, this is laughably simple, <laughs> all right? So if you have even done basic uh, solidity programming like I teach you on this channel, you could have potentially caught this. And I, to tell you the truth, I kicked myself that I didn't see this type of thing. It wasn't really a project that was on my radar, but let's just explain it. So you can see like a, a basic contract here. Uh, you know, inside solidity, you can create these things called modifiers, and those modifiers can be applied to your functions that change the behavior. And so solidity has a uh, really common behavior uh, pattern like the only owner modifier where you can implement access control where you can restrict who can call that function, like the owner of the contract. Or in this case, this should have been the migrator, uh, which is a different contract address. And you could have, uh, you know, applied an only migrator uh, modifier to this function, but it doesn't have it. If, you, if you're a Solidity developer, even a, a new one, you can see this is just an open function with no require statement inside of it and no modifier applied to the function. So that just means anybody could have called this. They could have gotten on Etherscan, uh, you know, found the smart contract like this, okay? Uh, if you'd read through the code, you could have gone to the right contract tab you know, turn on your MetaMask wallet and click the function uh, to do this. And so it's laughably simple in that regard. And one of the reasons I want to point that out is because, you know, I've made lots of videos about hacking on this channel, about ethical hacking, basically finding these vulnerabilities in the wild and not taking the money for yourself, but ethically disclosing them on a platform like ImmuneFi where you can re get rewarded for doing that. People will pay you to save uh, their projects from the bad guys because many times it's going to be an existential threat for early stage DeFi projects, okay? So one of the reasons I say this is because a lot of times people think like as, as they're new developers, they're never going to find some big complicated exploit. Well, this was not that complicated. You didn't have to write special code. You didn't have have crazy in-depth knowledge in order to spot something like this. So it's an example that there are things out there that even beginners could find. And now because this was laughably simple, that brings me to my next uh, point, which is really this topic of not just this exploit, but others was uh, if this was this simple, how did this sit so long undetected? You know, was this something that was actually... Uh, an inside job, okay? So that's the, really the question for lots of other DeFi projects that have been exploited again. 
Uh, every single time this happens, uh, there's always the question is, is the reporting, okay, uh, actually indicative of the truth or is there more than meets the eye beyond what's on the surface? Uh, because of these 3.3 uh, or $3 billion plus attacks in 2022 alone, most likely some of them were taken advantage of by people who are already familiar with the code. Now let's peel that back a little bit because there are instantly people who meet this with skepticism because they're thinking like, hey, it'd be way too hard to pull off a DeFi hack as an inside job and actually get away with it because let's say that you, know, you work at a DeFi uh, project, right? And then essentially, you know, you're in the middle of doing, like you're in the middle of still working on this team and you'd like perform this exploit. And then people, when they're doing a post-mortem on the attack, like they're probably going to interrogate everybody who's technical on the team. And you're going to have to be able to keep it to yourself uh, and, you know, be able to be convincing that you didn't do it. So concealing that's actually going to be pretty hard. And then you'll have people who will say, well, yeah, but if you did that, why wouldn't you just instantly quit? Okay. Well, unless you plan to completely disappear entirely, it's going to be really hard to uh, not paint a massive red target on your forehead because you quit right after an exploit went down. Now, again, you could go off the grid, but let's take it to a next next level, okay? And this is what I think is more likely than uh, performing an exploit while you're still part of a team is essentially uh, becoming aware of a vulnerability or putting one in there inside of a project and then waiting much later until after you've moved on from that team before you actually perform the exploit itself, okay? Because that's gonna distance you from the problem. And so that looks like one or two things. So let's say there's a security vulnerability inside of an app. Uh, you could have put it there intentionally, right? You could have been paid to essentially write this thing and say, well, we're just gonna like do something that looks like it was just, uh, you know, a careless mistake. Or, right, you could be working through something and then realize that there is a careless mistake made by somebody else or just a bad, you know, uh, engineering. And then instead of disclosing it and fixing it, you just leave it and then you leave and then later you take advantage of it because the financial upside is way higher than just getting paid whatever your regular salary is, uh, you know, to, to fix it. And now a lot of other people will say, hey, th how is that going to happen? Because so many of these smart contracts go through security auditing before they actually go to mainnet. And so, yeah, you might have a developer who leaves in something either on purpose or just overlooks something on purpose. But a security auditor is going to catch that. Well, not necessarily, okay? Um, so you'd be surprised at some things that security auditors don't catch, you know, either on purpose or out of incompetence or just a rush job or whatever. But you also have to take into account that the security auditor could be the person that overlooks a problem that somebody else put there and also takes advantage of it later, okay? So you could have a scenario where maybe it's not a developer who actually works on the team uh, who created a problem on purpose. Maybe they created a problem by accident. A security auditor catches it and then goes, hmm, let's say you got paid $100,000 for the audit, right? You're not really going to make any more money if you just patch up the vulnerability. Let's just say you take the money. It's like, okay, no contract's good. And you have know, 50 other problems. You don't disclose the actual vulnerability. You wait for some time and then you go take advantage of the exploit yourself and you take a lot of money. Uh, or you just you anonymously disclose it, all right, on a, on a bug bounty marketplace and get paid at least double what you were going to get paid for the audit under the guise of, you know, ethical hacking, when really you should have been, you know, disclosing it under your first rounds of audits in the first place. And now you're going to have all kinds of people who are saying, hey, man, you're like way overthinking this. This really falls more to the category of Hanlon's razor, which basically is an adage or a rule of thumb that states never attribute to malice, which is adequately explained by stupidity or, you know, incompetence in this case. And the whole idea is like, hey, what you're saying is f way too far-fetched and way too complex. Most of the times, it's just people not doing their job properly. So I think that can be the case. But honestly, I think that a lot of the exploits are mixed bags. Of all the $3 billion plus that have been exploited in 2022, you're going to tell me that none of these were inside jobs or taken advantage of by people who are familiar with the code before it went live to mainnet. I think that's, you know, really unlikely. Now, whether that's the actual case for this particular Temple Dow exploit, I don't have a strong opinion on that matter, but most likely that's the case for a significant number of these in the past couple of years. All right, so last but not least, you know, uh, because this attack was laughably simple, you know, how could you actually start looking at some smart contracts yourself to see if you could spot vulnerabilities and potentially make some money off this? Again, not so that you can steal money from a smart contract, but that you can ethically disclose it on a bug bounty marketplace like uh, ImmuneFi, for example. It's not a sponsored video, just a uh, particular project that I 
uh, like in the space. Well, one, you need to be very good at the programming languages. So that looks like, uh, you know, learning Solidity inside out. You can definitely go to my YouTube homepage and find some free Solidity resources there. You can also learn that through the blockchain bootcamp. You can sign up the link down below. Next, you want to get familiar with common hacking patterns and vulnerabilities that come up in Solidity smart contracts. So I've got several videos on how to hack Solidity smart contracts on my YouTube homepage as well. Then really what I would recommend is reading through different bug bounty reports or excuse me, bug reports uh, and hack postmortems because the more patterns you're familiar with, the more ways you can understand how contracts are exploited and start to think like a bad guy and look for these same types of things over and over again. And then finally, you can look through projects in production yourself, or you can browse through the list of bounties and projects that uh, have them on a platform like Immune5. All right, so that's all I got for today. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. The latest like videos is out so the moment we can learn about blockchain. And if you want to go for the throat and really master these skills so you can do exactly what I'm talking about in this video, I can show become a blockchain master step by step start to finish over at dabuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You guys been an expert to get started today. I thought people with zero coding experience become real world blockchain developers, uh, make 100K plus jobs in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. Until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.